Welcome, everybody. We've got a fun meeting in front of us today. I'm hoping at some point we'll have um, Sheena Banker join us from uh, Sun and Fun. And um, she's going to talk a little bit about their innovation showcase, I hope. But if not, I'll talk about it because I think I, I know what she was going to she was going to uh, brief us on. But until then, I always like to ask everybody if uh, if they have any uh, interesting projects that they're working on that they want to share uh, uh, a 30 or 60 second overview of. Um, I know uh, Dom John's got uh, a really cool aircraft that he's developing. It's unmanned now, but I can see it only getting bigger. And he just dropped a, uh, a video into the chat. If you want to see it fly, it's a, it's a, it's a really cool thing. Um, and uh, anybody else, any, anything ongoing? Anybody hiring? Hey, Firing? Andy, the, yeah. the video, I think, went directly to you. I don't see it. Got it. Yep. There. There. He just posted it for everybody. Yeah. So be... Thank you. Uh, please uh, feel free to watch. And we can talk and later. Can, and real quick, can you hold up the aircraft so everybody can see it? Yeah. <clears throat> So I was involved in human-powered vehicles. Fuselage is just like a streamlined bicycle, very uh, aerodynamic. And uh, it has four motors, two big propellers below, uh, two small ones in the back to control pitch and roll in vertical flight. But when it transitions, they go up and push uh, aircraft forwards. That's the main idea. And circular wing to be compact, stiff, and small uh, compared to the carrying capacity. It's fast. I've, I've seen the video. It's fast and it looks fun. <laughs> anybody else have anything interesting going on to report and, and or uh, anybody that's here for the first time or hasn't been here in a long time that wants to introduce themselves? No pressure, but if you want to, we always like to know who's with us. No worries. Uh, yeah. Todd Hodges, Go retired NASA Langley Research Center uh, consultant. And I now have three patents on a hydrogen burning turbine engine. So if the DBT is interested in that, let me know. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm Ben Nivert. Yeah. I work, for, I work yeah. for Michael at DBT Aero. I'm the chief of staff. So I'm looking forward to a great discussion and thank Andy for inviting us. Yeah, and, and Todd, here, please, please reach out to me or to, to Ben. Um, I'll drop my email, uh, but you can also find me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Uh, let's see, any any events that anybody's been to lately or thinking about going to? I, I know the Vertical Flight Society's got its uh, Advanced Air Mobility Infrastructure Conference coming up. Uh, next week so that should be interesting i haven't been to that one and i would like to go and then there's also in february we'll have the transformative vertical flight event in phoenix that's february 3rd to the 6th so i haven't bought my tickets yet but i would like to go to that one any others that uh, anybody's been at lately or would like to go to those will be a couple good ones well, oh yeah, hello. I think, yeah. Hi, My name's John Ward. I'm a Boral Applied Research first time attendee. Um, we will be attending the Advanced Air Mobility Exposition on in uh, Hampton, Virginia, outside of Langley. If anyone's interested in that, that should be a good event. Yeah, that is that the one in December. Uh, I should be October second and third. I'll Got be it. there also. Oh, nice. What's what's the gist of that one? It's uh, sponsored by AUVSI. Yep. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, they have uh, government, industry, uh, you know, just a variety of uh, uh, 
of of people that that give presentations. Yeah, very cool. I went to one. What? Oh gosh. Uh, I think it was in February. Uh, an AUVSI event. It was good. I enjoyed it. Hey, Did anybody Tom. go to the? I was going to ask if anybody went to the uh, commercial UAV event in Las Vegas. I, I was there. It was also part of the Flying High Hydrogen Conference. That's right. And How was, was it? It was. It was really good. Um, uh, didn't seem to be as many customers, uh, but there were a lot of service providers and a lot of OEMs. Um, very interesting. Uh, and, and then I had a presentation at the uh, Flying High Hydrogen side of things. Excellent. Oh, I'm glad you got to do that. It was fun. And hey, Perfect. John, I, I actually met Andy introduced me to uh, Nathan Graybill. Um, I don't know, about six months back. So very interesting capability that you guys have. Yeah, thanks. Uh, he actually tried to make it, but uh, he ended up going to the... Uh... <laughs> went over to the hospital for a, for an issue. So uh, he wasn't able to make it this morning and I jumped on him instead. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have to re reconnect at some point. Um, would love to get into your, uh, your wind tunnel at some point. Oh, that would be awesome. We'd love to have you. Anything else on, on the horizon, events or otherwise, that uh, people would like to talk about before we... Good to hear from Michael. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, give Michael Duke an introduction then. He's the founder and CEO of DBT Aero. Uh, it's an aerospace startup. Their mission is to decarbonize aviation by commercializing manned and unmanned aircraft. They go faster, farther, carry more, quietly, safely, and affordably. Um, check out the video if you get a chance. It's uh, they've, they've got a uh, scale model, and the thing just looks like a missile. It's uh, it's incredible, and it's just it is a very efficient design. Um, they have a DBT arrow stands for double box tail. Um, they have a patented double box tail design, uh, and are using that as a development platform for for different types of uh, power plants. And um, so definitely do talk to Michael if you've got something uh, interesting you want to partner up on. I, I think he'll be all ears. Um, they're scaling the technology from, from uh, a model that they've been flying. Uh, they're working on a, a larger aircraft and full size uh, development all at the same time, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool stuff. So uh, I think we're going to hear about some very interesting things today. Um, in terms of Michael's background, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's owned an FBO in the past. He's operated an FAA repair station. He has imported and distributed aircraft. He, he himself is a pilot, of course. Um, he's been a uh, IT leader. He's been in uh, cloud computing. So uh, a lot of interesting things, but I, I spent some time with Michael and his passion uh, comes out loud and clear. He loves being a pilot and loves aviation, loves what he's doing today. And uh, I really enjoyed getting to know uh, Michael and Ben, who is uh, DBT's chief of staff, and uh, I know they're building their team and doing some really cool stuff with a really exciting airframe design. So with that, uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Take it away. Let, tell us what you've been up to. Well, I will start by sharing my screen. Okay. And launch. Looks and, perfect. And, and I will start by saying I, whoops, I thought I canceled the announcements. Um, I, uh, I, I, I remarried and my second wife, uh, when we were dating, I took her for a ride in one of my light sports. Um, and I was doing two things at once. One, you know, taking her for a ride. And the other was I was looking for an airfield that was uh, on the charts that I had never heard of. And it's like, there's no airfield out there. So anyway, so, you know, she doesn't know where we're going. You know, I was looking for an airfield, but at the same time giving her a ride. And as we're flying along, I finally found it. And the light sport that I was in has um, doors and, and glass that comes down very low. So very similar to a helicopter, 
you can look, you know, right down um, at the ground without having to kind of have a door in the way. And so kind of a bubble. And as, uh, as I found it, it was on my side of the airplane. So I took the airplane, I kind of tipped it and, and said, look, it's right down there. That's the, the airport I was looking for. Well, of course, because I tipped it, she looks the other way because she doesn't want to look down. She's screaming, ah! And I'm like, no, look, it's right down there. So she wouldn't look. So I finally had to turn around, come back the other way. So it was on her side. Um, so I didn't have to tip the airplane. So she's like, I never want to fly in your little plane again. I'm like, hmm, oh, well, okay. So we get to Hawaii and, um, uh, and, and you know, we're our vacationing in Hawaii. We're married and we decide to go for a helicopter ride. So we're in an MD 500 beautiful helicopter and we're you know going around the island and we land and she says how come you don't have a helicopter <laughs> so so maybe vertical flight is in our future but at the moment we're focused on fixed wings and the reason we're focused on fixed wings is because of their efficiency and so i'll uh, talk a little bit more about their efficiency as we get in um, but we believe that uh, there's a way to make aviation more sustainable, and that's through a new geometry, and that geometry will uh, help to decarbonize aviation. So, as we all know, there are many problems in aviation, um, among them noise, high cost. Uh, if you look at commercial aviation, there's all of the TSA and the delays and the issues, but one of the biggest is pollution. And so um, the industry has set a target of getting to zero carbon by 2050. Uh, sadly, we don't believe the industry is going to make it. And one of the primary reasons the industry isn't going to make it is because the industry is focused on incremental change. Now, that's being said for the fixed wing side of the house. Uh, certainly the vertical side of the house, there's an awful lot of innovation. On the fixed wing side, we don't see the new geometries like Dom John and others, you know, are working on. So uh, incremental improvements just aren't enough. And we feel that um, the fixed wing side of the house is ripe for disruption. Um, we believe there's really two options. Uh, one is new propulsion systems, and we applaud all the people who are working on new propulsion the more sustainable uh, propulsion that the industry can develop, the better. And yet we don't think that's enough. We believe new geometries are a key part of that um, journey to sustainability. Batteries currently are just too heavy. They're not, they don't have the energy densities that we need. And when jet fuel is currently 52 times more energy dense uh, than what we can get in production batteries, um, it doesn't really matter what you do uh, with, you know, uh, geometries, it's just not enough. You can't get the range. Now, if you're concerned about a shorter range, that's fine. But if you're looking for the traditional ranges of a fixed wing aircraft, the, the batteries uh, are just too heavy. One of the things that was um, learned in the automobile is that if you want to go electric, you need to streamline the vehicle. And so a new geometry in the automotive industry is, you know, we're seeing that new geometry. Um, a Tesla uh, is able to get 300, not, uh, 300 statue miles. Um, and, and while, you know, pick your own favorite classic car, whether it's a Duesenberg or a 57 Chevy, whatever it is, they're just not um, aerodynamically efficient. And so we need in aviation to be de developing aerodynamically efficient geometries and the current aircraft uh, with a tube on a wing just is not aerodynamically efficient. So and everyone, everyone, can I have everybody mute, please? I forgot to ask at the beginning of the meeting, but I want uh, us to be able to hear Michael. Thank you so much. So if it, what we've been focused on is developing an extremely efficient aircraft. And so you see an image of the CFD on the right. And what we're working towards is uh, approaching the theoretical efficient frontier called the Gabrielli von Karman limit. 
most aircraft are, uh, they're great, they fly well, but they're much less efficient. The, uh, it turns out this design is more than 30% greater efficiency. Winglets are about 3% increased efficiency, but the box tail turns out to be more than 30% efficient. That allows us to combine uh, increases in range, payload, and speed uh, all into the same aircraft. If you just want range, you buy a sailplane. Sailplanes are incredibly efficient but you don't get much payload and you don't get much speed. If you fly too fast, you literally pull the wings off. If you want speed, you have a very short wing and they're, they're delta shaped. If you're looking for payload, you have a very thick wing and a large fuselage. But our current aircraft designs don't combine range, payload, and speed. And this aircraft does that. Ken Schwartz, if, you're, uh, if you can hear this, please mute. Uh, and I think the other one is uh, Gaylord, if you can mute. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so what we end up with is a, a fuselage, a, a design that can handle 35% more useful load. It's 90% quieter. We don't have the drag. We don't have the turbulence. And we're working on uh, new propulsion systems and we look forward to others who are developing theirs to mate with the aircraft so that we can be quieter. And because of the unique fuselage shape, it also provides us with 40% more cabin space, uh, which can be used for cargo as well as passengers. Um, and uh, we feel that that can be a game changer. Oops. And here's a little video. This is our quarter scale. And that one is our 3D printed aircraft. And this is our uh, full scale manned aircraft, 32 foot wingspan. And we have some other videos online that you can follow those. This was during our build of the 3D printed. And there's receiving our airworthiness certificate. So we think that right now is the kind of a perfect storm. There's an awful lot going on. On the one hand, you have uh, people demanding more sustainability, and yet the private uh, private jets are are increasing in uh, in usage. During COVID, it went up 300% in private jet travel. So you have on the two sides increased jet travel, and yet you have environmental concerns. At the same time, we have an awful lot happening in, in technology um, with batteries, with hybrid, with composites, as well as with our development. We feel that right now is the perfect time uh, to be bringing this aircraft to the public. Uh, we've developed four aircraft, uh, three subscales. On the top left is our 3D printed aircraft. It has a five foot wingspan. Um, weighs less than 11 pounds. Um, it cruises at about 60 miles an hour on half throttle, so it's pretty slippery and moves pretty quickly. Um, I'm not showing the eight foot wingspan. The one on the bottom left is our uh, nearly 11 foot wingspan aircraft. It was built the rattan style, um, you know, fiberglass over foam, um, fun aircraft. And then the, the top right it was our manned aircraft during flight testing. Oh, I've got it flipped to reverse, sorry about that. Um, the other side looks the same. 
Uh, that was during uh, Tuft testing. So if you've seen the movie uh, Ford versus McLaren, uh, we put little uh, tufts of string of yarn all over the aircraft, and then we videotaped it as it, um, you know, as it taxied and flew, so that we could get a sense for where was the turbulence uh, in real life. And we we're happy to say that um, it exceeded our expectations, and we were able to reduce turbulence significantly, um, almost to, I mean, imperceptible in many places. We could not find any turbulence uh, at certain uh, parts of the aircraft. So we we're very pleased with how it turned out. We also have um, uh, a computer-based simulator, and um, uh, you know, continue to move on forward. We have some patents, and we've been on the cover of a few magazines. Where we have some uh, letters of support from a number of uh, companies, and we're periodically asked to speak. So we're starting to slowly get the word out, but mostly we've been pretty quiet. Our uh, path to market acceptance, um, it is kind of a unique aircraft. We've looked at uh, the drone market. We're not convinced that um, that's a market we wanna enter at this point in a subscale. There's an awful lot of competition and people are focused on uh, cutting margins and uh, gaining market share. And there's other markets that we feel are better for us. So we're looking at starting with a four seat uh, aircraft, uh, the same size as our current manned um, uh, proof of concept, and then moving into a nine passenger regional air mobility. And I'll mention briefly why, but I think Andy's also gonna talk about regional air mobility. Um, he's been doing some work in, in that uh, area as well. Um, we also have the option to go to larger aircraft in the future since the design scales very well. Uh, the other option is that we can take an airframe such as the four seat or the nine passenger and make those unmanned. So then you would have a large unmanned, um, you know, cargo drone or whatever. So uh, it works well as a drone. We're just not going after the, uh, the small unmanned drones at this point. <clears throat> uh, from a regional air mobility standpoint, uh, this is a map of the various commercial airports and the bubble size has to do with the uh, passenger enplanements. So you can see there's a very small number of airports where you have the largest amount of enplanements and much of the country doesn't have airports at all, uh, not commercial air service. So you could end up driving more than three hours to get to a commercial airport to fly to a hub one of the larger uh, bubbles, and then from that hub, fly to some other airport, which hopefully is your destination, but you, it may not be. You may be going from hub to hub to final destination. So while this, the hub and spoke architecture is cost effective for the airlines because they're looking for um, uh, asset utilization and keeping a small number of assets in the air and keeping them full, it is not particularly great for the people when they want to get point to point. Um, as an example, I grew up in Western New York in the little town of Corning, which is a lot of fun, uh, being at the headquarters of what was formerly called Corning Glassworks, uh, kind of a cool place. Um, so I'm familiar with the East Coast and I was surprised to find out that there is no direct service between Pittsburgh and Columbus. Both of those cities are about 1.7 million in population and you cannot fly between them directly. You have to fly to uh, some other city, whether it's uh, you know O'Hare or Detroit to Newark, uh, Washington DC, DCA, or if it's uh, you know, even Charlotte, there's a number of different places you can fly, but you can't fly directly. As a result, you end up with some pretty long uh, commute times if you're trying to fly between them. So what happens? Rather than deal with um, uh, the flight, people just drive. It's faster to drive the 180, 85 miles than it is to hop a plane and, uh, and, and fly between the cities. Um, we feel that that's a problem and something that regional air mobility uh, could easily solve. As I say, uh, people tend to drive more than they fly. 
these are the Department of Transportation statistics. Um, and, and I had to put it on a map. It just blows me away every time I think about what is 999 miles that people are driving rather than hopping a plane. It is a really long way. Um, but you see that, you know, it, people are doing it. It's crazy. So um, we need to fix that. And that's uh, the thing that, that we're focused on. Private air exists. And so a lot of people, you know, they, they do hop on a plane, but they charter it, they have a fractional, they own it themselves. Um, but for most of us, um, we just drive or you, uh, you, you waste the time um, flying and going through uh, TSA and all of that. So using our aircraft for regional air mobility between Columbus and Pittsburgh, you can see what a difference uh, it makes in the uh, flight time and the overall time. I mean, our flight time is 36 minutes between the cities, and yet, you know, you include the, the drive, et cetera, and uh, it's still much, much shorter than having to um, go through the commercial airlines today. <clears throat> Here's actually all of the airports <clears throat> that we have in the U.S. Um, you can see that there's, um, a nine, it's 19,000 and change. There's an awful lot of airports that are available to people. We just don't use them because the uh, economics for the airlines today are not there. And so by providing an aircraft that's more efficient, we believe that those economics will be improved and we'll then see a lot more travel to a lot more airports. And we believe that'll stimulate um, economies in a lot of these smaller towns that currently don't have aircraft service. It also provides things like air ambulance and next day cargo or same day cargo. So there's a number of uh, uses for these airports and they're just not being used today. <clears throat> uh, as we look outside the United States, there are a lot of countries that don't have the ground based infrastructure that is in the United States and Europe and a few other countries. And so as we look at the countries that are that don't have all of that ground-based infrastructure, it's a lot like telephone service. Rather than putting in wireline, they just skip the wireline and go directly to cell phones. We feel that there are a number of countries throughout the world uh, or regions like the South Pacific, the Caribbean and, uh, and others, where people will just skip directly to regional air mobility and not even uh, look at highway or other types of infrastructure. So I'll close um, sharing uh, an incident that is really driving me. Um, my daughter-in-law and her husband live up in northeastern Montana. He works in the oil fields. And one day she was doing some laundry and their house kind of blew up, caught on fire, and she was badly burned. Needed to be transferred to a, uh, a burn center and the nearest burn center uh, was in Colorado. So th there was no way really for them to get her to that burn center other than in an ambulance. It was too far for a helicopter and too expensive. And um, they didn't have, you know, a nice uh, air ambulance, uh, Pilatus PC-12 or something to, to transport her. So she ended up going by ambulance. Um, I think that's horrible. Um, the amount of suffering that the, the poor girl had to go through that could have been saved if we had aircraft that were faster and more economical um, so that she could be transported by air. Uh, I, I just have no idea how much that was. I know how much pain she was in. And I think we need to solve these problems and quit focusing on uh, having uh, hub and spoke architecture. We need the ability to get people point to point and we need to make it affordable. And that's, uh, that's our mission, is to make point-to-point uh, -point aircraft affordable through efficiency. And at the same time, decarbonizing the entire industry. So um, I'm Michael Duke, and we are hoping to fly farther, faster, and carry more. And we appreciate, uh, appreciate you listening in today. Um, I will bring up this last slide. if. Uh, People want to take, uh, in fact, what I will do is I will cut that and put it into the chat 
and you can then go take a look at some of the videos and um, enjoy the, the videos that we've created. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Andy or Q&A, whatever you'd like. Perfect. Perfect. No, we'll do both. Uh, Michael, that was fantastic. And uh, you, I had originally planned to do a presentation on regional air mobility uh, in association with your presentation. And I will do that in the future. But frankly, I'm glad I didn't because you touched on all the salient issues about uh, the opportunity for change that we have given the infrastructure that, uh, you know, those 5,000 aircraft, 5,000 airports in the United States that are underutilized that just don't have the aircraft uh, economics right now to support them and, uh, and, and need to be supported. And, uh, and, and while everybody's thinking of questions, uh, quick story, I, Michael and I talked about how I also lived in Corning when I was young, and I don't think I ever did mention the fact that, Michael, when we talked about it, my, my grandmother lived in Virginia at the time, and I don't have to tell you, there's no airport close to Corning, so you just, as you just said, you just get in the car. So every time we'd want to go see grandma, we'd all load into uh, uh, dad's uh, black VW bug and zip down through the snow and everything else eight hours after his work day on Friday to go down for the weekend, he'd get in. I don't know how exhausted he was at, you know, one or two in the morning and we'd spend two days with her and then do the Sunday afternoon, turn around, do the whole thing backwards. It was, it was nuts. Uh, and, and that was, you know, the, and that was the best way and kind of still is. And, and then later on in life, uh, when I was selling uh, business aircraft, I, I learned that Corning glass, the, the company, uh, to, to combat that issue, they had two Dornier 328s uh-huh. that they used to shuttle their employees around for the same reason. There, there isn't any better way to do it. There's nothing uh, in terms of you know regional coverage or hub and spoke that will help them. So they had to go their own way, which works for companies, but for the rest of us, it leaves us in a VW bug for eight hours. So uh, we need solutions like what you're working on. And I appreciate that you are. Thanks, Andy. I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll echo what you just said. Um, when uh, my my dad was born and raised in Salt Lake City, and my mom is actually born and raised in Copenhagen, and her family moved to Salt Lake City after World War II. Um, they met, married, and my dad uh, graduated from the University of Utah in ceramics and became a researcher at Corn and Glass. Eventually was part of the team that developed Corel, which was kind of fun. So I grew up learning about all of these processes and things happening at Corning. So he moves back to New York Um, and we would uh, want to visit all of the family. But needless to say, getting family in the 1960s from New York all the way out to Salt Lake was really difficult. So it turns out Corning had a program, a vacation program where every fifth year, so anniversary, your fifth year anniversary, 10th year, 15th year, they gave you an extra two weeks of vacation. So during those anniversary years, every five years, we would drive from Western New York out to Salt Lake camping along the way because it was a three day trip. So we would stop and have to camp, and then we would get to Utah, spend a week in Utah, and then we'd spend another three days camping to get back home. So we burned up two weeks to get to Utah, and so we saw the in-laws every five years. That was it. Um, And yeah, those Dorniers, uh, Corning actually had a a strategy. They, They moved from Brooklyn, they were originally the Brooklyn Glassworks, moved up to Corning because it's where three rivers meet. So they got coal from the Ohio River Valley, sand, the silica they needed from the Great Lakes and the Erie Canal. And then they took the finished product and they shipped it out via Erie Canal to the Hudson River down to New York City where the finished product was sold. So it was a strategic location. Well, so then through the late 1800s, they're developing you know, additional plants in fun places like Charleroi, Pennsylvania. Um, and, and so they had a strategy of actually going to remote locations where they didn't have to worry about unions because they were the only big company in town. If there was a strike, 
there was nowhere for anybody to go except they, you know, they move out of town. So they didn't have a lot of problems with unions and strikes back in the, you know, the, the late 1800s, 1900s, et cetera, because they had all these remote locations. Well, that's great for one reason, but it's horrible when you now have a larger company and you're trying to get people back and forth to all these different locations. And so suddenly now they're not going to move the plant. They're going to shuttle people. And that's where then the, the Dornier 328s come in is they then started to uh, use that to shuttle, uh, you know, they have a problem at a plant or they need to, you know, visit the plant for some reason. They, they end up having to shuttle uh, people. And I spent time, you know, on those shuttles as well, going to the various plant locations. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need a much better means of travel than we have today because the, the airlines are focused on um, that uh, asset utilization and you don't get it taking a small number of people to remote locations. Yep. Uh, what questions do people have for Michael about uh, DBT or the aircraft uh, synergy or regional air mobility in general? I had a yeah. question. Michael, great, uh, great presentation, uh, great product, amazing, uh, amazing design, love it. Uh, we're doing a similar thing in the vertical takeoff and landing space, uh -huh. regional air mobility perspective. But I'm curious and and fantastic job getting a full scale uh, prototype flying. That's amazing. How how I'm just curious about the performance specs. And I realize that that can be a little sensitive subject, so I'm happy to hit that offline if you want. But just what kind of performance are you seeing on the full scale aircraft versus what you anticipated um, in terms of efficiency, speed, uh, range, etc. So <clears throat> we. We have a laminar flow uh, wing and a laminar flow fuselage, natural laminar flow. Um, that's very dependent upon maintaining boundary layer. And so, you know, bugs and icing and, you know, dirt, other things can, can interfere with that. Um, the CFD uh, suggests some pretty amazing performance. We um, have decided that we don't want to rely on that um, because you're, you're very seldom going to get perfect conditions. So our expectations are actually that we'll get, you know, 20% uh, less than what we're seeing in the CFD. And even at 20% uh, less than what's in the CFD, our, um, our current uh, four seat aircraft is projected to have a cruise speed of over 220 knots. Um, okay. with a range of 1,200 nautical miles and a useful load of around 1,200 uh, pounds. So 1,200 pounds, uh, useful load, 1,200 nautical miles, a uh, cruise of 220 knots. Um, there's, there's nothing else that's even close. Um, the Cirrus SR-22T, uh, if you include an IFR reserve, it has less than a 500 nautical mile range. It cruises at 200 knots. Um, and the useful load is well under our 1200 uh, pounds. So um, we think it's pretty, uh, pretty transformative. Um, love what Cirrus and Cessna and, you know, all the others are doing. Um, but it, it's time that we had something that's more efficient. Oh, great answer. Uh, and second question is, uh, how do I reserve one for myself? Because that it looks like an awesome airplane. Awesome airplanes that, that look that good generally tend to fly good. So <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Michael. Well, I, really, I really appreciate that. Interesting that, that you should ask. We've had a number of people ask that question. <clears throat> so we went to our attorneys and said, hey, can you put something together? So actually this week, uh, we finally got the paperwork back from the attorney. We actually are, are now selling uh, delivery positions. Um, so we don't want to make a deposit per se. That means we have to keep the money on the books for the next you know, few years while we go through certification. But if we sell a slot, people actually can resell those and it becomes, you know, a commodity, uh, that you can, you can actually then go purchase one in the future, or you can use that slot and sell it to somebody. If somebody says, I want your low, you know, your low delivery number. And, um, so we are, we are actually starting to sell slots this week. Thank you. <clears throat> Great work. Yeah, so send and, me uh, send me an email and, and we'll send you the paperwork if you're interested. 
and we've got about uh, five more minutes before we'll, we'll pivot to our uh, to Sheena, our other speaker. But I wanted to hear more questions for Michael. Hey, it's Bruce Kogan, NASA Armstrong. Um, the Dornay comment was kind of interesting. Um, we um, were out here at Edwards Air Force Base, and in the old days, we um, used to have a shuttle service for the day to go up to NASA Ames um, using a King Air. Um, we don't have that anymore. Um, but we actually found if we want to go up there, you know, it's almost better to drive than take the airliners by the time you go to the airport and such. So, so even NASA is, you know, who's kind of cutting edge in all this, you know, we kind of have the same thing. So um, definitely a good use case. And um, maybe we can get some vehicles like this. Well, we'd love to sell NASA some and, um, you know, happy to have NASA uh, get in line and put down a, you know, a, a purchase slot for for the nine seater <laughs> you guys to, need a partner you should partner up that nasa has all the best wind tunnels michael yeah i don't know better be careful john's on the line they have a pretty interesting wind tunnel too <laughs> yeah we'd love to partner with nasa and get uh you know get some of our designs in the wind tunnel and see what they see what they think what other uh, questions or comments does anyone have about uh about synergy or regional air mobility. Yeah, this is John Ward. I was going to ask you: had you had you looked into other than personnel transport, like transporting goods and you know for different uh, carriers? I think you mentioned it momentarily, but I was just wondering if you'll go a little bit more into that. Sure, we've spoken to some of the the major cargo carriers, and uh, one of them actually shared with us. Um, all of the aircraft that they have, how many, what their, uh, you know, their average um, route length is and all kinds of statistics. And I asked them, what, what is it that, you know, that you would, if you could change something, what would it be? What is it that you want as a cargo carrier? <clears throat> and they said, you know, we're a lot less concerned about the EV tolls, even though a lot of us have orders for them. Um, their comment was that what we re really need is a better caravan. We cube out before we gross out. So they're running out of volume before they run out of, uh, you know, gross uh, uh, mean takeoff uh, weight. Um, and, and so as we talked to them and said, well, you know, we have a, a larger, a larger cabin, you know, would that be helpful? And they're like, absolutely. Um, and so they're very excited uh, about, um, you know, the potential uh, both for manned cargo, um, I mean, piloted cargo, as well as unmanned cargo in the future. And so our focus is as we build an airframe, we will use it for multiple market opportunities. So you can put seats in it or you can uh, take the seats out and have one pilot and use it for cargo or air ambulance or you know, whatever else you can think of, put sensors in it for um, you know, forest fire spotting, whatever it is you need to do, or you can make it unpiloted. So our focus is that the control systems will be um, similar between a, a manned and an unmanned aircraft. And we can basically swap out a stick and a seat for a command and control. Um, but the airframe will be very similar. And so we're looking at everything we can do with a single airframe at a particular size. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The, it's a really neat aircraft, I really like it. So congratulations and excited to learn more about it. Thanks. Yeah, I can talk about the aerodynamics uh, and all that kind of stuff, but this is, isn't probably the forum, but be happy to do that at some point. It's really kind of fun. Oh and yeah, we have, that'd be great. Uh, we have time for one more question before we, we uh, pivot to our, our next speaker. This is Gaylord Olson. Can you comment on um, the um, auto aviation um, proposed aircraft? Are they making any progress, do you know? We spoke to auto um, before they made the big announcement with the Solera. Their fuselage is a laminar flow, uh, so is ours. Um, so we were sharing, you know, yeah, you know, here's what Carmichael said. And we went, we spent some time going back and forth with them. 
Uh, their focus was to use a traditional, uh, more sailplane-like uh, high aspect ratio wing, um, where you know we have our proprietary uh, wing and tail configuration. I am not aware of where they are with the redesign. I know that they raised an undisclosed amount of money. Um, I heard it was around 50 million. They brought in a new team, and with that new team, they actually did some redesign of the aircraft. So it looks a lot more like a uh, traditional uh, business jet now. Um, their focus is really long range, high altitude kind of business jet um, competitor. Um, our focus is would be below the flight levels. We can build a larger, faster one, but we think that right now the market is you know down below the flight levels for regional air mobility, personal mobility, um, air ambulance, and those things don't need the uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the flight levels, pressurization, et cetera. Thank you. You bet. Perfect. Uh, Michael, this is fantastic. I know this is, uh, just a, a toe in the water for us with respect to all the work that you and your team have been doing, but it's exciting stuff. I love that you're, uh, reinventing the aircraft, but you're not reinventing all everything all at once. Uh, you're using existing infrastructure and you're making a, uh, a much more efficient aircraft that can potentially be a platform for uh, new types of uh, power plants. But um, I, I feel like you're doing it the right way. And uh, I, I'm sure I can speak for all of us when I say it's going to be exciting to see you succeed. So thank you very much, Michael. Yep. Thanks, Andy. And I look forward to working with all the different propulsion folks, the you know avionics folks, everybody. There's a lot of people in the industry making interesting developments. Um, we would love to uh, partner with folks and and uh, take the best of what's out there and move it into our aircraft so that um, we've got the best of everything. We know that we can't develop um, everything. Our focus is the airframe, the geometry. Now we need to rely on you know the best of the industry for propulsion and avionics and you know gear and everything else. So uh, we look to the rest of the industry to leverage their uh, innovation and expertise. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. Michael has dropped his email address in the uh, chat. Uh, feel free to grab that. I also included, uh, uh, if you click on his name in my email, it'll take you right to his LinkedIn page. And uh, I know he's an active LinkedIn user as well. So two good ways to get in touch with him. All right. Now we're going to pivot to a, a, what's going to be a super cool presentation. Sheena, if you'd like to share your screen, go ahead. Uh, we're we're uh, joined by Sheena Banker, who is the director of business development for the Sun and Fun Air Show, and um, that looks like the yep. And if you want to go full screen, uh, then we'll be able to uh, see the whole the whole page. That work? I th not exactly. I think we're okay. seeing the version where um, it's not full screen right now. Let's see if we go. I can also, here, let me, sorry. No worries. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk while you uh, uh, do some experimenting, I'll but uh, Sun and Fun is an air show. That's, that's pretty good right there. Okay. And if you can go full screen from from that one, even better. Otherwise, um, so this is good. a PDF version of it. So Got the it. full screen version of the PowerPoint for some reason is going into a video. I don't. I, I, think I have not a way to, used Microsoft the... 365 enough to be <laughs> proficient in it, so I apologize. <laughs> no worries. I think if you go to, um, I think PDF has a full screen version. If, if you go to the top menu, there we go. That's that it. Perfect. Okay. That's you, you nailed it. So I'll I'll finish my very long intro. But <laughs> um, Sun, the Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo is a, a fantastic and very large uh, multi-day aviation experience in Lakeland, Florida, which is right between Tampa and Orlando. So I try to go every year. And because uh, I can, I can drive from my place in South Florida, and it it, it just it's like um, uh, it's it's just got a little bit of everything from OEMs to performances to and and now 
Um, Sheena's been busy adding um, uh, innovation aviation, uh, next generation uh, technologies in the aviation space and so forth. And um, so what she's going to talk to us about today is a little bit about the event, which will be in April, and a little bit about opportunities for us uh, that are uh, organizations that are startups or have new technologies that uh, um, we're interested to, to showing and showing to the public. So with that, Sheena, take it away. Floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, so as he said, uh, we're an air show. It is um, April 1st through the 6th of next year. Um, and um, it is Lakeland, Florida, Central Florida. So beginning of April in Florida, very mild temperatures, but we do have air conditioning, um, air conditioned tents. So no worries if it's super hot. Um, so as, as he said, we... So we're an air show, but I wanted to give you guys a little background on really what we are. So our parent company is the Aerospace Center for Excellence. The acronym is ACE, um, and ACE is our education arm. So what Sun and Fun, the fly-in, is, is basically a giant fundraiser for our education program. We have a high school on our campus. Those students graduate with either their pilot's license or their AMP and go to to work straight out of high school uh, as a mechanic. Um, we also have a technical college on site for AMP school. It's very cool. We do field trips for in everybody, all the kids in fifth through eighth grade in Polk County. Um, we have the museum, we have simulators, um, all sorts of things. We say that we are cradle to cockpit um, for our education program. So, I, ha I can't talk about the air show without talking about that because this, this is, like I said, basically one giant fundraiser for it. Now, that being said, I'm not here to be like, give me all of your money. Um, so a lot of you guys are startups. I understand that. I come from the startup world. I come from the eVTOL world um, prior to this. So I understand. I get all of that. Um, so we want to make this accessible to you guys. Um, so the space. So here's our map. So here's um, here is our um, a, a close up of the map um, of some of our grounds. Um, so we have an indoor space and an outdoor space. So if you have an aircraft uh, that can fly, we can fly you. If you if it is airworthy, we can get you on our main flight line and or during our sunset aerial circus. Um, so there's multiple options. Um, our air boss is Dennis Dunbar and he loves to, um, get the spotlight on new and innovative things. So in addition to showcasing in the innovation showcase, you have the av uh, availability to fly if you're able to, um, now with the innovation showcase, the first year, your space is complimentary. So like I said, I'm not here to be like, give me all your money. Um, so the space is complimentary for the first year. We understand it's going to take you resources to travel, to stay, um, all of those things. So um, your space and your credentials are complimentary for the first year. Um, and that includes everything about our air show. So you are required to staff your booth from nine to five. Um, but two, uh, so we're six days. So on the first, which is a Tuesday, we have a concert uh, that's included with your credentials. Um, Wednesday and Saturdays, we have the night show. Uh, this last year, our night show included not just airplanes and fireworks, but drones and lasers and um, all sorts of fun stuff. So we um, we go big, um, and it's it's a really really great show. Um, and then we also have the Sunset Aerial Circus, which is a twilight uh, twilight show, in addition to the day show that's from one to five every single day. Um, so if you have an aircraft, like I said, we're able to get you to fly if you're able to fly. If um, Otherwise, if you have other innovative aspects of you know anything having to do with flight, um, we are able to showcase you in the innovation showcase as well. So, um, what I'm looking for is anything that is aviation related, that is new, that is innovative. Um, last year we had 
companies from charging stations to um, this guy had a a little wind turbine that went on the um, on the wing of your airplane that powered your GoPro. So your GoPro didn't die while you were flying. Um, to Wing, um, I'm sure the drone company, I know a lot of you have probably heard about them. We had them doing deliveries uh, several times a day throughout the um, spot, one throughout the ground. So one of the times we had them drop candy and it was like a pinata and kids came running. It was great. Um, and then we also had Lyft Aviation here last year so with their Hexa. So inside they had... Uh, they had their simulator and outside they had their aircraft. Uh, their aircraft did fly during the show. So it's some really great, um, really great uh, exposure for everybody. Um, I have one company in the innovation showcase last year that um, not just one, but five investor companies approached them during the show. Um, so we, we highly promote that this is there. Um, and then we, once the spaces are filled, we start promoting the companies in there. So we will we will promote the bejesus out of you guys uh, to get you visibility. Like I said, five, five investors came up to one company. Um, within two months after the show, one of them had inked a very, very large deal, like life-changing for that company. So there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of success at this show. Um, so I would just like to invite you guys to apply. So that's um, kind of the next part here. So um, Andy, I believe you said you're going to send out an email post uh, this I, conversation. I sure will. And I okay. just dropped that that exact email address into Perfect. the into the chat so people can click okay. on that right now if they want. Awesome. So uh, my email and then also the link. Um, so the link to the website, you do have to fill out a small application. Um, basically, I just want to make sure that you are in the aviation world, that you have something innovative that qualifies for this, uh, you know, that you're not just, you know, new fancy hair extensions or nail polish. Like, let's be real. Let's let's keep this uh, on task. So we, we do get those every year, unfortunately. Um, so that's why there is the application process. Um, but as long as you meet the qualifications of being in aviation, um, that's not a problem. Sheena, that is a huge uh, offer in terms of uh, not just financial value, but uh, leverage for startup companies to blast off. But I'm just curious about a couple of things. If, if you're giving us a what feels like a very large value opportunity here, what would be the cost for a, for a display area like that if we were a uh, profitable company doing the same sort of thing? I mean, it's not inexpensive, right? You've got how many people, 200,000 people wandering through your event yes. every year? So at least 200,000 people come through within the week. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really great exposure. Uh, so the cost of the booth, if so um, if you, so for the first year, like I said, it's complimentary. Second year is half price. Third year is full price. So that's going to cost you just over $2,000 for full price. Uh, so, you know, like I said, we give you credentials with that as well, um, parking, all of that. So we try to make this as accessible as possible because we know that you have to spend money on your resources to get everybody here and um, be at the show. And we, we really appreciate that. Well, it sounds like you're offering everybody three thousand dollars in value minimum, two thousand in the first year, a thousand in the second year, and by then, you know that can help everybody leverage up to start to make a little bit of money and be profitable, and then give back to you. And money given to you isn't to you; it's to right. educational programs, to education, you, you, and it's to you, the children. Yeah, come on, people for the kids, right? Right, but support you, the kids. Briefly, Who doesn't love that? You so, briefly mentioned the museum, but I actually love that museum. It's an excellent museum. It is. We have, um, it's actually right outside my window. I get to look down on it um, <laughs> every day, which is awesome. Uh, so if I ever need a little pick me up, I just look out and get to see some really cool, really cool airplanes. Um, but yeah, in the museum, like not only do we have amazing aircrafts, but we have what's called science on a sphere. We're one of the very few places in the world that have a full globe um and we can use that for absolutely everything 
Um, so it, it's a really cool learning tool and we have an entire simulation lab. We have a drone lab. Um, I got to see one of the summer camps actually like building their own little drones and learning, you know, if, whether or not they could fly, uh, so that was super cool. Um, like I said, education is our mission. Um, you know, airplanes are just the really fun, shiny lure to hook them on learning. <laughs> I love it. Hey, um, Andy, Sheena, yeah. I, I know we're over time, but I wanted to put in a plug. When I was importing and distributing uh, light sport aircraft, we would go to Sun and Fun and, uh, and show them off. It's a really different venue than Air Venture. It's much smaller. It's a lot, you can see everything um, very friendly. Uh, very different vibe, a lot of warbirds and other things at, at Air Venture, whereas Sun and Fun is really kind of, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's almost like tailgating, you know, you get a bunch of people together and you hang out for the week and just enjoy aviation. So it's, it's a real different vibe, very fun venue. Um, and I would encourage, you know, anybody to, to take Sheena up on the offer and hopefully we will too. Awesome. Thank you so much for those kind words. It. So I, um, I'm actually newer to the company, um, but I was an exhibitor last year and I got to see that firsthand, just the, the hospitality and really and truly how fun of an air show it is. Ironically, um, Sheena, where did you relocate from to take this job? Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was born and raised in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So I grew up two blocks away from Air Venture. So I watched that air show from the rooftop of my childhood home. Perfect. Hey, I'm going to send out the details that you sent to me to the all Thank the 300 plus members. Thanks for being here. We'll have you again anytime you want to be here again between now and April. I want everybody to hear about this because this is a big offer you're throwing at us. And I really appreciate it. And I know uh, people will take take you up on it. And uh, it's uh, it's going to be a, a nice accelerant to this uh our industry. So thank you for being here, Sheena. And yeah, uh, Michael, thank you. thank you for your presentation. Uh, both fantastic. And um, I see big success for both of you. Thank you. With that, I'll ever, everyone get back to their day. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.